Hello and welcome to episode 62 of the Market Maker podcast. And in this episode, we are going to focus on Elon Musk and his attempt to take over Twitter. I've had lots of emails sent to me uh, privately asking for us to do an update on this. And yeah, we, we gave it a miss last week during Easter. So we're raring to go. And as much as giving our take on the situation, it's obviously an evolving story, but hopefully we can deconstruct it, explain some of the kind of finance jargon around it as a subject matter, hostile takeovers, LBOs, white knights, poison pills, uh, you name it. This story's got got everything. So before I begin, Piers, just how's it going? How's your week been? Before I uh, give a quick summary of the week in general. Hi, yeah, going very well. Actually, I was uh, something quite cool happened yesterday. I was at um, Credit Suisse. I was doing the running the their spring week program, which we've been involved with this week. And um, actually, yesterday I was. I don't, I don't get to be on the front line much anymore. Not like I used to be in terms of getting out there and running our simulations and you know being in well certainly being in front of people. Right, obviously, COVID's pushed us all online. So yeah, it's quite nice to just get back on the front line. Um, but what was quite cool, I was running, we were actually running our IPO um, simulation, um, focusing on the IBD side. But yeah, there were there were a few people in the group. Uh, so these are Credit Suisse kind of spring interns who were just coming up and saying, oh my God, I listened to the podcast. <laughs> uh, in fact, I would, you know, I've been, I listened to the podcast the night before my interviews, you know, just to make sure that I'm uh, fully prepped and up to speed. And so, yeah, it was quite... No pressure then. <laughs> right, yeah. Right, it was nice to... I guess it's odd when you're doing recording these things because basically it's me and you in a Zoom meeting. Yeah. And <laughs> it's nice to know that there are actually people out there that listen to this and, and, and well, by the looks of it, get, get some good value out of it. So... Um, so, so yeah, it was it was nice to, nice to hear. Well, look, we'll um, we'll do our best to cover all uh, investment banking divisions today because I can give you a quick <laughs> a quick overview on my side from the global markets perspective, uh, and then perhaps I can play a little naive and, and and ask you the questions to go into this Twitter Elon Musk situation, which definitely encompasses a little bit more of the more investment banking side. Yeah. Um, so look, let me let me run through a couple of the highlights of the week. I'm sure everyone would have read and seen it by now, but Netflix shares got absolutely decimated after they reported a loss of 200,000 subscribers during Q1, the first such decline in a decade. Going one step further, they forecast a further drop of 2 million this quarter. The other kind of related stocks like Spotify were down 11% on the same day. Disney were down about 7% as well. But the infamous fund manager, Bill Ackman, you know, if you thought oh, those 50 bucks I've got in Netflix shares got hammered, uh, this guy got it hard on that Ouch. day. He lost a cool $400 million in that one earnings release. He accumulated a stake of $1.1 billion just in the last couple of months. And I can't remember the stat from the top of my head, but roughly... I think there were 54 odd Wall Street analysts covering the stock. So this is when you're talking about an equity research uh, team specifically putting out notes when they talk about the financials and forecasting of these companies. And I think it was something like 48 of them had a buy recommendation and only three had a sell at that point. So there's a lot of people nursing some severe uh, hangovers on Netflix this week. Well, well, Ackman, he actually bought, you know, yeah, so as you say, he bought his stake in the last couple of months. Do, do you know what he was trying trying to do? He was buying the dip, uh, not realizing there was another massive dip still to come. <laughs> because what happened well, on their last earnings call for quarter four earnings, which was in January of this year, they announced, they, they revised down their subscriber growth forecasts for quarter one of 2022. And they revised it down to a growth of 200,000 subscribers. Obviously now it materializes it's, um, uh, they've lost subscribers, right? But mm. that, that, that revision down of subscriber growth rates led to the stock dropping 30% in January. So that's where Ackman came in and 
waded in, got the bat out, mm. bought a massive chunk. And obviously now it's just dropped another 30%. And um, he, yeah, he's, he's, he's wearing a $400 million. I did uh, read, not... though, uh, that his fund, um, Pershing Square, isn't it? That's, that's accurate. Yeah. That he had record breaking 2019, 2020. So I'm not going to cry over Bill's 400 million just yet. Yeah. Um, but look, let, let's pivot over to kind of broader. Uh, economic view, I guess, that's impacting central bank thinking. And the Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell outlined his most aggressive approach to taming inflation to date yesterday. So on Thursday this week, potentially endorsing two or more half percentage point interest rate increases. He described the labor market as overheated. I read this morning, came out overnight, latest report out of the Japanese bank Nomura. They're now expecting the Fed to go in two 75 clips now in June and July, oh, follow, follow, following up on the 50. So they, they, their strategy is they think they're going to go 50, 75, 75. Now, well, I can tell by your face, the listeners can't see it, but yeah, it's just, we, it's we've been just, here before. It's, it feels like. I'm so, I'm so, what world, what world are these analysts living on? They're, they're well, all, well, do you know, well, this is, I guess one thing that definitely students should be aware of, these are sell-side institutions. And yeah. so Nomura is the one that I've seen mentioned everywhere this morning, like everywhere. Yeah. Doesn't, doesn't you know, go amiss when you put out a bold call because right. the financial media love it. Now, I mean, how often are any of these calls correct? I mean, you could only go to like m m most big bank forecasting and they're woefully off the mark a majority of the time. But that Nomura's name's been out there, dominated the news sphere uh, for the last 24 hours on that front. But if, if Nomura are right, we will have a very large recession in the United States in the second half of this year. A large recession. They're talking about raising rates by 2% in over the course of what, three, three months? That, that would be catastrophic. I would suggest it's okay. not going to happen. And then looking in Europe, the theme continues because the vice president, Louis de Guindos, said the bank should be able to phase out asset purchases in July. That will pave the way for interest rate increases early as that month. Uh, that hawkish turn comes as several ECB officials uh, have kind of said similar types of hawkish things. Money markets now betting on three quarter point rate hikes by December from the ECB. And then sterling is lower quite a bit this morning, actually. It's just dropped through, at uh, least in the futures market, the 129 handle against the dollar. It was trading yeah. around 131 24 hours ago. So seeing significant weakness, it's a dual force effect here. There's dollar strength apparent with a lot of the yield move and, and rate expectations on the US side. But equally, we've had retail sales coming out of the UK this morning, dropped more than expected. UK consumer confidence sank for a, a fifth straight month. Uh, economists in a regular Bloomberg survey say they now put the chance of a UK recession in the coming year at 30%. That's the highest it's been since early 2021. So that's the kind of, the overall theme here is that rates are rising. <laughs> And the markets, certainly from yesterday's reaction to Powell getting a little bit more serious and hardening that, that kind of rhetoric, uh, we saw tech stocks get hit quite aggressively yesterday, uh, in particular, but stocks in general came under pressure as the, the dollar surged. And then taking this to the, the political and geopolitical space, France, Macron, I'm going to say this, Macron looks set to win the election yeah. on the Sunday. Uh, that follows the live TV debate we had midweek. The general snap poll outcome was that, again, much like he did in 2017, came out slightly stronger. Um, the overall volatility bonds credit markets aren't showing particularly high degrees of stress at the moment. One thing I would say then is, although this looks like it should be fairly smooth, by function of what I've just said means if there is a shock, it's going to be pretty forceful in the initial reopening of markets on Sunday night. So um, that would be in at least a knee-jerk reaction, euro weakness, European equity weakness, particularly in the French market, 
but also the peripheral bond market people would look at, namely things like the Italian yields and the subsequent spreads and so on. But yeah, the only way it's going to happen, the only way Le Pen can win is if the complacency amongst the Macron supporters is so extreme that just a, a whole big portion of them just don't bother turning out which isn't the case. France are pretty good in terms of turnouts and, and getting out there and actually voting. So it's just, he's, Macron's a shoe in isn't he? So it's done, I think. Well, we, we weren't going to leave the EU either, so <laughs> I'm going to reserve judgment. So, um, but one thing just before you move on on Europe and rates, because that's quite a big, well, I guess it's a hawkish pivot from hmm. the ECB. And obviously, we, we, we're quite used to central bank hawkish pivots um, these days, given what's happened with the Fed and the Bank of England and all the rest of them. But I think the timing of it's interesting, because if you look at, we don't often talk about currencies, <coughs> excuse me, we don't talk about FX and exchange rates much. Um, but if you look at the euro against the dollar, then, I mean, that thing's down over 10%. It's down 10.7% this year. So that's the euro weakening against the dollar in, in the world's biggest currency pair. That's a massive move in, in a pretty short space of time, you know, driven by this monetary policy divergence where you've got a super hawkish US central bank leading to dollar strength and the ECB remaining a bit more, new, well, not a bit, remaining neutral and on the fence until now. And so you've seen this euro weakness, dollar strength. But one thing to note is the 2020 low um, for euro dollar is at 106.50 roughly um, and more than that the low, the big lows we had in the eurozone debt crisis is down around 105 so the currency exchange rate is 108 on the on the nail right now as i speak 108 106.50 and 105 um, are very very key really key very long-term kind of technical levels and i think the ECB are a bit mindful that these are approaching because, you know, if you get a move below, certainly below the sort of 2014, 20, 2015, 2016 kind of triple bottom, you may well see an acceleration to parity. And then this is where, you know, the currency, then the euro weakness is so accelerated that it's just going to exacerbate the inflation problem that, that obviously everyone's so panicked about. So I think... I think the exchange rate is one of the reasons the ECB have just decided, you know what, let's, mm. you know, let's probably just tweak up the dial on the hawkish front. And for those not aware of it, that's not uncommon, right? The ECB, comparative to other central banks, specifically when it comes to currency, are quite vocal and have been as a historical precedent. So why would that be? Um, well, they have been vocal, although their their official stance is that they're their, their mandate is not to control um, the exchange rate, of course, although clearly that's what they're doing. Um, it, they're, they're, they're more a bit more sensitive to it just because, well, certainly Germany, hmm. um, who, who's the, obviously the biggest and the powerhouse economy in, in the Eurozone, um, is unusual, unusual as an economy in that it's quite geared towards exports, unusual for a large developed economy, right? If you think about the US or the UK, about, I think it's roughly, very roughly about 80, about 15% of GDP is exports. Okay. For Germany, it's more like 40% of GDP is, is exports. So for Germany, actually a cheap currency can, can work in their favor. But flip it onto the other side. Look, if you're a developed nation, you're importing, like all the other countries in the Eurozone, you're importing huge amount of your goods that consumers pay for, you know, buy in shops, right? And if your currency devalues, then these goods that you're buying from abroad become more expensive. And so that price rise then feeds into inflation. Um, and obviously, we've already got a big inflation problem. So I guess the ECB are worried that if this continued accelerated devaluation of the euro continues, then it's just going to have a negative feedback loop into what is already a big problem on the inflation front. Well, talking of, of currencies, there is one specific currency which is heading for its worst weekly drop since the pandemic began. Uh, yes. The, I think the yuan, no? Yeah. The yeah. Chinese renminbi is is actually heading for its worst weekly drop, uh, going all the way back to when the pandemic uh, took hold. 
deterioration of economic outlook. There's obviously the COVID situation. They're still tackling at the moment. And of course, as we mentioned, rising US yields um, and the dollar strength that we're seeing imparting further pressure on the currency. So yeah, the, as we've kind of always had simmering in the background, it feels on this channel, China continues to just be a little bit of a going concern. <laughs> yeah, I feel. Well, not yeah, and and that little bit, I, I think that's a big understatement. I think I think mm. it's uh, it's a, a concern that is not getting priced properly into markets at this mm. point. Again, I was just talking to Xiao, who runs our China office. I was talking right. to him this morning, mm. um, and he's still stuck in our, our office in China is in Shanghai which is obviously one of the key big cities that's in full total lockdown at the moment. And he's actually in Beijing at the moment. He, he, he wasn't in Shanghai when the lockdown happened. Um, and now he's just hanging out in Beijing because apparently the kind of morale in Shanghai is just has been destroyed. People are, mm. they're, they're so, uh, like to the point where expats are just leaving now like permanently looking to now leave Shanghai. They're worried that, I was just talking to him about stuff that we've got on in China in the summer, like June and July. And people in Shanghai are just thinking, well, maybe we'll still be in lockdown by then. There's no, there's no visibility on mm. when this ends. And they're locked out. China lockdown is, is proper lockdown, right? Not allowed out of the building lockdown it's not like the lockdowns we had in europe where oh yeah it's fine go for a walk in the park once a day whatever yeah. you're not allowed out so you know i think the the medium to long term damage being done is huge and 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 economically i uh, just yeah i well we've been pretty vocal about our opinions on china's handling of this but yeah it, i think the the COVID situation in China right now is the worst it's ever been. Not necessarily, I'm not talking, let's, let's say, cases and deaths, and more, more in terms of the nation and their mood around what's happening uh, and, and how the government's clamping down on everything. And, and it's, the, yeah, it's the way the lockdown has been implemented and the way it's been policed. Um, the morale's at a record low, basically. Mm. And then linking um, to China, Russia test fired a new intercontinental ballistic missile, as you do, in what Putin said, it will give the US and allies a little something to chew over, <laughs> which is pretty much a verbatim quote from, <laughs> from Putin. Um, not, not unusual, I guess, the flexing of military muscle, but obviously the context is right in the middle of this ongoing Ukraine situation. But the connection to China which I thought was interesting that no one really talks about um, is the fact that it comes as China has said also this week, we'll continue strengthening strategic ties with Russia, which I know we've talked about many times, but just given what's going on and the type of maneuvers Russia's been pulling, um, because China kind of moved a little more to the West, I'd say uh, yeah. a few months ago, but now kind of reverting back to type to a certain extent so then the final thing to lead us into twitter is tesla put in a record profit um just to throw it in our faces again uh, revenue growth was driven in part by an increase in the number of cars tesla delivered an increase in average sales prices shares spiked 10 percent um, on the recommencement of trade on thursday however they did pretty much reverse most, if not all, of that gain by the close. So um, when we start talking about a trillion-dollar company popping 10%, um, that's pretty normal standard business day for, for Tesla shares. But then, of course, that leads us into Elon Musk. And so Twitter, I was kind of thinking, prepping up for this, where do you even begin with this? It's just so messy to a certain extent. So I thought... Going at it from a chronological order makes the most sense. So he started accumulating his stake, 9.2% stake in Twitter to become the platform's biggest shareholder. He was offered a board seat. He originally agreed to abide by several rules set out by Twitter when he joined the board, including not increasing his stake in the company past 14.9% of shares. Internally at Twitter, 
I don't think it was particularly popular when, when the news emerged, to put it lightly. He then flipped, declined the board seat, and then has made a hostile bid for Twitter uh, with the value, valuation of the company at around $43.4 billion. Um, so I guess let's start at going hostile before we then talk about self-defense if you're Twitter and poison <laughs> pills, and then we'll, we'll take it from there. Yeah, I mean, it's such, such I love these stories. It's, it's such a great saga. Um, we haven't had one for a while like this. I, in fact, have we had one like this? It feels like quite a unique kind of situation. But yeah, going hostile. I mean, it's just simply um, trying to buy a company without the, um, the, the permission, if you like, or, or without having the board of directors who manage and run that company um, without having their backing to do so. So you're just going hostile against those that control and run the company. Um, so several months ago, Twitter is not looking to sell itself. It's not looking no. for a new stakeholder. He starts accumulating on the sly. It then emerges when he does it, was it a 13D or one of these filings comes out, comes to yeah. light, bang, he's got 10% of the company pretty much. Then... Then what happens next then? So Twitter now goes into defensive mode. Well, yeah, I mean, I, it's a bit odd, isn't it? Because he filed that 13D, which is you only file if, well, A, we talked about this, I think, last time, but he filed it late. Mm. It was like 11 days late or whatever. But you file that if you don't have an intention to take over the company, right? And so then it was like filing that and then, right, yeah, there's a board seat, you know, I'm a you know, large shareholder now. And then I think, I don't know what happened behind closed doors on that discussion on, right, here's a board seat, Elon, do you want it? And I think probably what happened was, well, look, here are the restrictions that you need to agree to if you want that seat. And Musk went, actually, you know what? I want to buy this whole thing. So I, I can't sit on the board because I'll have to agree to not purchase more than a 15% stake. So I think then he stepped back, then he filed this 13G, I think it is, which is a separate filing, which then... Um, expresses your intention to look to acquire the whole company. Then it's like the board are obviously clear now that what Musk's intentions are to buy the whole lot. And then they go into emergency defense mode and they trigger the poison pill. Um, it's got to be one of the best named um, corporate actions uh, out there, I think. So what, what is this? You know, I, I just think of like Rambo and Arnie when I hear that type of, of thing. So what's this got yeah, exactly. to do with like a, a it's, corporation? It's a pretty extreme, one of the most extreme sort of defense mechanisms that a, um, a, a board of directors can put in place to block someone buying uh, a majority stake or buying, you know, the whole company. So what happens here with this particular one with, with, um, Twitter, basically what happens is they've geared it so that if Musk buys shares in excess of 15% ownership, then for every share that Musk buys, a new share gets issued. And that new share is then purchasable at a discount by other shareholders other than Musk. So Musk is the only shareholder, would be the only shareholder that's not allowed to buy the newly issued shares. All the other shareholders can purchase this newly issued discounted value share only unless they themselves, another shareholder, then accumulates uh, ownership above 15%. So it's basically anybody above 15% can't buy these mm. newly issued shares. The point about these newly issued shares is that it's then diluting the the value and indeed then the actual proportional ownership of existing shareholders, right? So it just makes the, for, for my, I don't know, let's simplify it. Let's say there's, let's say there's 100 Twitter shares and let's say, twi um, let's say uh, Musk buys, owns 15 of them, right? So we've got 15%. If he buys the 16th, right, then a new share is issued. So there's now, then, then Musk owns 16 shares out of 101 shares in issuance, 
right? And if he buys another one, he'll own 17 shares when there's 102 in issuance. And so it dilutes his value and prevents him from basically, or prevents him or makes the, well, yeah, prevents him in this case, but in other cases where there isn't a mechanism that prevents the uh, person from buying the newly issued shares, it makes it way more expensive because you have to, and not only you're buying the existing shares, you're having to hoover up and buy all these newly issued ones as well. And it, you know, makes the actual, in the end, the price that you have to pay. Mm. You know, is, there a, is there a set marker for the discount that the existing shareholders would get? I mean, how now, severe is the discount? Is it like 99% or is it 70% I, I, or? I have not been able to find that information. Mm. Because so, they're going to make it as easy as possible, right? As to that they can buy as the biggest discount. Yes, but the more the discount, the, 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 the this is a this is a dangerous strategy from the board's point of view mm. because it dilutes the share ownership of all shareholders. Mm including Musk, and obviously their intention is to dilute Musk, but they're diluting themselves as well, although they can buy these newly issued shares, but not everyone's going to be able to buy right. or would want to buy, right? So you are going to negatively impact existing shareholders outside of just Musk. Mm. Um, by the way, this is called, there are different variations of a poison pill. This is a, what's called a flip-in poison pill which is the yeah. most common, which is where the, the hostile, the person who's you know, leading the hostile takeover, that one entity is not able to buy the newly issued shares, but all other shareholders can. That's a flip-in version of um, a poison pill. Um, so what, so what, what would be other, is there any precedence for a poison pill being successful as a strategy for Yeah. There are. I mean, the poison pill thing, um, it kind of, first it came to, the first example of it was in the 1980s, actually. But, and it, it's not common, but it has happened um, and actually happened with companies that you'll all have heard of. So actually a really good example is Netflix. So Netflix used the poison pill strategy in 2012. Carl Icahn, who's a very famous activist investor, um, started building up a stake in Netflix in 2012. He got to a 9.98% stake. And then the next flip board said, look, we, we, need, to, we need to block this. Um, and so they, they um, went ahead with the poison pill strategy, which triggered if ICANN bought shares in excess of 10% of the company. Um, it worked. ICANN backed off. Um, and actually, because he, he bought, um, I think he bought a $320 million stake for his 10%, okay? And he wanted to buy the company. He thought Netflix was ripe to be taken over by one of the big tech giants. So he thought, right, I'm going to buy it and I'll flip it to one of the tech giants. Um, anyway, the board was successful in their poison pill strategy. In 2013, uh, sorry, um, in 2015, ICANN then sold his 10% stake. He, he did pretty well because he bought it for 320 million and he sold it for 1.9 billion. Um, so he did all right in the end, even though his attempt to buy and acquire the whole company um, failed because of a successful poison pill defense strategy. So, and it has, you know, Papa John's, the pizza lot, they did it to block one of their founders from trying to take over the whole company. So look, it happens. Um, and it can be successful, uh, but it's quite high risk. Mm. Okay, so then moving the story along, we've now got to the point where uh, Musk has put out a whole series of you know, very classic Elon cryptic tweets, kind of inferring that he's going to make a tender offer. So let's talk about a tender offer and the financing side of, of right. what he's been doing. A tender offer is you just go to the shareholders. I mean, ultimately, who owns the company? It's the shareholders that own the company, right? Who, who, who controls the day-to-day -day running of it? Well, fine, it's the board of directors, okay? Now, sometimes you'll have this standoff where the board of directors don't want Musk 
wheeling in here and taking over, but it could be that the shareholders think differently. I mean, are Twitter shareholders happy with their hmm. management? Are they happy with their board of well, directors? Well, tell, tell me that then. I mean, what, what's the, the kind of general view on Twitter and how it has performed as a, as a company? <clears throat> well, yeah, I mean, I would say it's, well, I would say, and lots of people might say that it's performed really badly and it hasn't ever got anywhere near to fulfilling its potential. You know, one of the co-founders, Jack Dorsey, <clears throat> who's on the board and still actively running the business, he runs other stuff. You know, it's not the only company he's got. And, it, and I think a lot of people think that he's just been distracted by his other stuff and he's not really invested. And the other, the other big criticism of the board, Twitter's board right now, hardly any of them use Twitter <laughs> and hardly any of them own Twitter shares. Um, you could argue that Musk obviously is the opposite, right? He is a prolific user of Twitter. He's got 80 million followers and now owns 10%. Um, so who's a better representation on the board and to run this company? You could argue it's someone who uses the product all the time and is invested in the business and, and its success. So that's one thing, but a really good, has Twitter performed well, yes or no, from an investor's point of view, probably the best measure I could give you is that Twitter was founded in 2006, um, two years after Facebook, right? Facebook was founded in 2004. Um, in, since 2006 to today, Twitter's share price has gone up 77%. Um, Facebook's share price, bearing in mind that Facebook's share price has also been hammered over yeah. the last sort of six months. Even with that, the Facebook share price is up four times more than Twitter's share price. Hmm. So that right there shows you that Twitter never really delivered. Um, and look, there's so many, I guess, <clears throat> revenue streams that have been untapped, perhaps, hmm. um, you know, with regards to maybe looking at subscription um, kind of based things. I mean, look, uh, perhaps we need to talk about the whole, to talk about can Twitter fulfill its potential or not? I think you've got to talk about, well, what is it and what is it for? And um, really this perhaps plays into why Musk wants to do what he looks like he wants to do to take it over. And that's it kind of comes back down to this, it comes down to free speech. Hmm. OK, um, Musk is a huge proponent of free speech. He went as far and I'm going to quote. He said something yesterday. Civilization risk. That's a new risk, by the way. I love it. But literally a risk to the whole of civilization. He said civilization risk is decreased. The more we can increase the trust in Twitter as a public platform. He's a big freedom of speech. And the problem we've got at the moment is the freedom of speech is progressively being more controlled by a handful of people who run big tech. Okay, This is the fundamental issue here. Mm. You've got a handful of people unelected that don't represent the people, yet they control the narrative. And the narrative then controls how people think and how they behave and how economies function and X, Y, Z, right? We're talking about big, big things here. And Musk is fed up with people getting cancelled. And I guess it comes back to people like Trump. Yep. Right? I was going to say, when's he, when's he getting his reinstatement of his Twitter account? Then? <laughs> right. And I guess, I guess the point is about people who believe in free speech. It's like everyone should be able to say what they want to say and put forward their view. If you don't like it, don't follow them. Don't listen. It shouldn't be, hang on, if you don't like it, cancel them so that no one anywhere can hear them. So it's about that free speech thing. But the problem with Twitter, I guess, there's so much content from every effort. Mm. And it's a, it's a platform people just use to go on and rant about stuff. And there's, there's so much crap on Twitter, <laughs> let's be honest, right? So you need some kind of filter and something that Twitter, a revenue stream they've never explored is maybe going a bit more open source. And this is something that right. in terms of the algorithms that are used to kind of control content. And I think one thing Musk wants to do is go a bit more open source 
on developing of these algorithms. And then to the point where you as a, as a user can maybe subscribe to a certain filter. I don't know, maybe, I don't know, let's say you're interested in tech stocks, right? And you want to use Twitter to you know, be knowledgeable about stuff that's going on in the tech industry. So you could perhaps subscribe to a one particular algorithm that, that kind of filters for news on that front. And you, you pay a small subscription for it, right? Um, and I'm sure people would pay to get rid of all the crap that they're not interested in. But when I say crap, I mean, one man's crap is another man's, you know, <laughs> gold and <golden> nugget <laughs> content, right? So, and this is the point, it's freedom of speech. Say what you want, and it's up to you, the people, if you want to listen to it or not. So I think that's the kind of cornerstone of Musk's motivation here, I, I believe. But then we talked about, uh, I'm, I'm kind of jumping to different things here, but we talked about what do gazillionaires do to get their kicks? Um, we saw Bezos moving into media by buying Washington Post. Is this right. the kind of Musk equivalent? So what is, this, is, what is his intention? Is it for getting kicks and he's got nothing better to do? Or is it, you know, a genuine push to, um, you know, influence free speech globally? Or finally, is it actually he believes this company is undervalued? Does he believe there's some huge, great extra additional revenue potential? And can he take this company and 10 exit um, in the next decade? So, or, sure. or for, fourth angle, is this all just completely curated narrative so that he can engineer an exit of his setup with Tesla? And so that he needs to follow this, this chain of thought and all of this. You know, he's a smart guy. So he's probably thinking at least several chess moves ahead. Yeah. So th he's well beyond this deal, success, no, no success. There's, is there another element here where I, for one, do not under, understand or know deep enough how he's structuring his exit out of companies like Tesla and yeah. whether this is playing into that somehow in order to, you know, tax and all the rest of it, options, ex expirations or exercising and trying to facilitate that. And actually, he's just, he's a guy who just wants to make a lot of money. And this is just the narrative to to execute yeah i think you're definitely right i think there's an angle i mean we've, we've been talking about musk's big problem with his his wealth as a person well it's locked up in Tesla. <laughs> that problem yeah so but how, how, how do you <laughs> how do you liquidate that wealth right and we've been mm. talking about this for months and months and months and months about how well hang on if elon starts selling tesla shares well isn't that the signal that this is the, this is the top so everyone else says, and the, and the share price collapses, and obviously his wealth collapses with it. But um, I think this is probably another strategy, you know, along the lines of engineering an exit from Twitter, because we've got to talk about financing, right? Because this deal with Twitter has taken another step towards potentially happening on the Musk side, because he's now come up with the financing. Mm. So it's all very well and good saying, here's my tender offer. You know, I'm go I want to buy all you shareholders out there, I want to buy your shares for what was, what was it? $54.20, isn't it? I think um, per share adding up to then a 46.5 billion valuation. Yep. Um, but that's all very well and good saying that, but, but $46.5 billion is a lot of money and where are you going to get it from? So the next exercise Musk has been working on over the last week is structuring the financing of this potential deal. Um, and part, you know, part, I mean, the financing is going to involve, so we believe, um, term loans, credit facilities, secured bridge loans, unsecured bridge loans, margin loans, um, and then something you probably will understand better, cash. Um, <laughs> cash making up about 40% of the, the, the kind of deal um, here. But in terms of the, uh, the kind of, numbers hang on a minute I, i've got the kind of breakdown here if i can just find it so yeah um so he's been talking to lenders musk has and so bank of america barclays and the like um are apparently are now going to structure some of this and so he's so a six and a half billion 
dollar term loan, a three billion secured bridge loan, a three billion unsecured bridge loan, five hundred million dollars revolving facility, margin loan. Yeah, the biggest portion or one of the biggest portions is a twelve and a half billion margin loan secured by Musk's Tesla shares. Mm. So obviously, with loans, you need collateral usually to kind of underpin that loan. If you think about a house and a mortgage is probably the best example, right? Your, your collateral is the house, the building, and then you're borrowing money against that. Um, so Musk um, is going to put up some of his Twitter, uh, sorry, Tesla shares as collateral. Um, but he's already used a big chunk of his Tesla shares for collateral for loans in the past. So um, there's a bit of uh, I've, I've read a few different figures as to how many shares he's actually uh, putting up here as a, as a loan. And then there's cash, right? Um, and so we're talking 21 billion maybe in cash. And there we, we believe he's going to have to generate that by selling some of his Tesla shares. So here's a great excuse. Guys, I'm not selling my Tesla shares because I don't believe in Tesla and its growth story anymore. Right. I'm selling Tesla shares purely because I need to buy Twitter for the greater good of mankind and civilization. Right. Now you're talking my turkey now. <laughs> right. It's, well, it's, it's, if you step back and just say, it, it is genius. Uh, now, and and to think how long has he been towing the freedom of speech line? A long time. Yeah. So he's been engineering this. This is my view that for a long, but he's, again, he's an incredibly smart guy. And to think that this is all randomness, I think yeah, you're, yeah. So you're you buying into the This is just hype. his exit strategy that yeah. he started a decade ago. Because he but, knows, he knows. Yeah. The, auto, the big giants in the automotive world are coming. And so it's time to move this up a gear or two. So yeah, I mean, I, well, I certainly agree on the, uh, the Tesla, I, yeah, I think this is very toppy for Tesla in terms of share price. So if he can exit now, I think it'd be genius. And, and this would be a really interesting, a, a genius way of finding the excuse to, mm. to engineer a major exit. The other thing then, of course, is because he's kind of structured the financing now, this obviously makes his bid much more serious, tangible, mm. and that's good from the shareholders' point of view. So can he now say to the shareholders, look, you know, this poison pill thing from the board, essentially no one ever really then goes ahead and tries to buy the company and, and absorbs this huge extra cost that all these newly issued shares take. So what tends to happen with the poison pill deal is that it forces the hostile takeover person to start to have a dialogue with the board about how, how we can make a deal work here. If the hostile person has the backing of the shareholders, well, this puts the board in an incredibly difficult situation. And at the annual general meeting, which is actually in May, I think it's towards the end of May, if, the if there's a shareholder revolt, then you don't allow the board to get, I think there's two people on the board that are up for re-election and they won't be re-elected. And then you might get new people that are pro-Musk deal on the board, so he could play this game of really essentially forcing the board via the shareholders' support, via these votes at the annual general meeting. You know, so I, and the second thing is, once the financing structure is in place, he can then start to talk about maybe bringing on board some partners. Right. So explain to me this part. Where does the private equity angle start to, to come into this? Yeah. So essentially, he needs to come up with $45 billion, right? And He's proven, I guess, on paper that he can do it himself. But that's huge risk, even for a man of his wealth. Mm. You know, that's a lot of money, right? Um, so what I'm sure he'll prefer to do is bring other people into this so that he doesn't have to stump up this cash all by himself. And so you're starting to get some private equity interest. There's a, there's a, a software buyout group called uh, Toma Bravo, who are thought to be kind of at the front of the queue here, um, they've got about 100 billion in assets and they've taught this, they've begun conversations with Musk. So they might take on some of, the, a portion of this money, a portion of the 46 billion, they might kind of come in on some of it. It might be on the debt side of it. Maybe it's on the cash side of the deal. Um, so I think that that would make sense, I would say, 
And I get, I, I, and again, that might be a positive from the shareholders' point of view as well. If it's not just Musk, the dictator coming in and just doing what the hell he wants, um, so I think that'll probably be the next move as well. And then the the other kind of I, I guess alternative would be finding a white knight. So perhaps yes. we could explain what that is and why in this instance it's probably unlikely. Yeah. So a white knight is something the board should be working on right now, which is finding an alternative buyer at a favorable price. Um, now, why this might be difficult, because you could say, well, surely the likes of, I don't know, Apple or Amazon, um, you know, or Google, surely, surely a massive um, social media platform like this could be a great bolt-on um, to their businesses. But the problem is the regulator won't allow it. So the regulator would definitely not allow one of the big tech giants to buy Twitter. So cut right there. And because it's such a huge deal, you're going to need north of 45 billion, right, to have a better offer than Musk's. This is a lot of money. So yeah, the big tech giants can afford that, but they won't be able to do it because of the regulator. So I think this is a situation where finding a white knight that can come up with that kind of capital um, and, and who would want to, by the way, um, I think it's going to be difficult. Cool. Well, look, well, um, let, let's end it there. <laughs> I think we, we could go on and on with, uh, with this particular topic, but hopefully that addresses a number of the questions that I think came in to my inbox over the last two weeks. And yeah, thanks for, for buzzing me over the Easter uh, holiday. <laughs> but um, look, as Piers was saying, it's uh, just wanted to conclude with, look, I think it's amazing that people are listening to this podcast still after 62 episodes i think we're on now so yeah, a lot of hours of content but as pierce said i actually spoke to um a student who runs the main society at oxford university of which he's kindly invited me to go and speak at um in the coming weeks and he said everyone listens to the podcast and yeah. um, follows the market maker newsletter that accompanies the podcast as well so yeah don't forget to to check out that newsletter for any student interested in um, just building out your commercial awareness, but equipping yourself as staying on top of the news, what you need to know with career tips and hacks and so forth as well. We share lots of stuff on a daily basis. Uh, I'll drop the link into the, the bio of this episode. But that's it for this week. Piers, thanks as ever. And yeah, take care, everyone. Have a great weekend. Cheers, guys. Bye.